Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George Ortega, and today we're going to be talking about why deliberation is not evidence of free will. Okay, the idea is that um, some people will claim that because we deliberate, that means that we're kind of like choosing between various options, and that kind of like demonstrates our free will, but um, a simple, simple um, understanding of what happens when we deliberate, you know, shows that to be, you know, completely mistaken. I mean, it's kind of curious how otherwise, I suppose, very intelligent people who, you know, have gotten PhDs and all can, um, can make such logical errors, um, but, you know, this is the case with this. So that the idea is like, all right, let's say let's start off from the, um, the idea we're deliberating. Okay, we're we're d deliberating means that we're kind of like looking through various options before we make a decision. Okay, um, I think the best way to understand how deliberation is not evidence of free will is that. Um, um, all right, those options that we are um, that we are considering, the uh, the principles, the uh, other kinds of considerations, related considerations that take part in our decision. These factors are all um, in our unconscious. They all reside in our unconscious. Um, I mean, and it's, it's easy to understand that because were they to reside in our conscious mind, <laughs> imagine it would be impossible. You know, all the, you know, our memories, our um, our experiences, what we learned, um, what you know, what we felt, what we you know, all these like the data that we um, sift through, to um, that we deliberate deliberate on, to to make a decision. It's all. In the unconscious part of our mind, and um, and that's the problem. That is the problem because um, basically, um, you know, naturally, if, if all the data upon which we're basing our decision is in a part of our mind that we ca can't, in real time, consciously access, um, then obviously. Um, that deliberation is done by the unconscious. You know, if the conscious mind doesn't have access to the unconscious, the only part of our mind that does have access to the data in the unconscious is the unconscious. So, um, so the unconscious is deliberating, is sifting through. Um, through our thoughts, experiences, memories, or, you know, all this stuff, to um, to reach what it w predicts will be, let's say, the most pleasant, least painful, best, least bad, healthiest. Um, sometimes it depends. You know, we've got these imperatives: hedonic imperatives, moral imperatives, survival imperatives, procreative imperatives. All this that. Um, that take part in in um, in our decisions, but um, but again, um, because all the data upon which we're basing our decisions, upon which we're deliberating, is in the unconscious part of our mind, obviously, um, you know, the the result of those deliberations, um, as well as the deliberations, um, are not quote unquote freely willed by the conscious mind. Because again, when, when we say we have a free will, we are saying that um, we have a will that is completely free of anything we can't control. You know, that like our decisions are completely up to us. There is nothing at all that's compelling us to, uh, to think or decide or deliberate on anything. And naturally, um, again, when we remind ourselves that every decision is made 
by unconscious processes and un- the, our unconscious mind um, sifting through the data in itself, I guess, right? Searching through itself. Um, then, you know, we understand that because we're not in control and we're not even aware of that unconscious, um, you know, free will therefore becomes impossible. Let's, um, you know, I think that, that, was, that was a good explanation, I think. Um, all right, well, let's, let's explain it um, in terms of causality. Okay. Let's say we make, um, we're deliberating through various options. We um, come to a fork in the road. We can take, we can go left or right. Okay, um, and so we're deliberating, you know, which is it going to be? Um, is it going to be left or right? So then we make a decision, you know. We go one or the other um, road. But then here comes the problem for the um, deliberation as evidence of free will. Conclusion. Um, Whichever road we take, whichever direction we take, is going to have a causal history. That means that, like, there's going to be a cause to our having taken that road, having made that decision. And then there's a cause to that, and then there's a cause to that. So, again, what, what you have is, like, a causal regression spanning back to before we're born, back before the planet was created, back before the Big Bang, presumably. Um, determining the result of our deliberation. And so, like, this applies to either decision, you know, either the left or the right decision, you know, going left or right, it applies to either. So, so that's a pretty simple explanation of how causality um, really does um, make free will impossible. Um, I just want to, um, in terms like deliberation, in a certain sense, the, the, the term or the phrase deliberation really is a synonym for free will in a sense, or, or just kind of like, um, it's the illusion. I'm not, it's not, not, it, it's not a synonym for free will. It's, it, it represents, well, yeah, maybe it is. It represents the illusion. Um, we, we think that we actually have a choice between the left and the right road, but the reality is that that choice has been made for us by the causal past, by the unconscious. Those are, I think, um, the two basic ways of understanding it by the state of the universe causality, which is like the most general understanding. Um, Okay. So, yeah, actually I want to like talk about deliberation um, and our our process of of making decisions um, using a computer as as an analogy. Okay, so, um, all right, a computer is, um, is asked to do something. You know, you as the um, user, let's say you're, you're searching for um, some information. Let's say, yeah, a Google search. Okay, so you, you type in uh, what you're looking for, what you want. Okay, and um, and the computer is um, the computer represents all right. The hardware represents our body, and the um, the software represents our mind. So um, so naturally, the hardware we all understand. So the idea is like with the software. Um, once we issue that command of, of a Google search on some word, search for happiness, or free will in quotes, um, 
the computer, the software is sifting through um, the data, the memories, the um, the pages, you know, the files, whatever, the bits that um, that most directly relate to um, to that command, that decision, um, you know, according to whatever kind of algorithm is, is set up for the search. But um, so that's that's basically what um, what our unconscious is doing. I mean, um, our mind, you know, because again, since like our decisions are made at the level of the unconscious, um, the unconscious, I guess, um, gets a command from the environment. Um, you hear a sound, and the unconscious naturally hears it because it's making the decision. The, it's it's conducting the reaction, so it, it might just make a movement or something. And um, and so that's so. Then, in order to do that, the unconscious is kind of like, all right, what is this? You know. Um, you know, is it a threat? Is it? Oh, what is its meaning? Does it have meaning? Um, have I heard it before? Um, what should I do? What are my options? You know, all the, there are all these kinds of like factors that that come into play into this decision, and it's just basically like like a computer, um, simply, you know, um, sifting through its um, its memory base. You know, um, all right. Now here's the thing. Here's the thing. There's a book out now called Incognito by David Eagleman. It's a New York Times bestseller. It, it became a New York Times bestseller in less than a month. Um, I've begun to read it, and um, I have a feeling that that book will um, pave the way. I mean, the way this will seems to be going is that like when I started my meetup a bit over a year ago and then I started um, presenting episodes of Exploring the Illusion of Free Will in January, um, that caused an interest um, in human will that, um, that really wasn't there before because um, nobody, nobody else is really promoting this um, um, so very widely and so um, so but but people like Eagleman you know who's a neuroscientist and um, who's interestingly has another book um, New York Times bestseller called Some wherein he speculates about the um, the afterlife different possibilities I haven't read it but um, but what what um, Eagleman is doing is like he's explaining the neurology of why free will is impossible. And um, and what he does though is he kind of like he deconstructs our mind um, to show exactly how we're kind of like machines. You know, in a sense, he kind of like dehumanizes us. And now I, I don't want to like um, say that that's ultimately um, what he does because this is just like, you know, I'm very, I've just gotten into the book. But, you know, and some, you know, when I do this show, I, I, I do say sometimes that yes, we're, we're puppets, we're robots, we're automatons, we're actors. But, um, but here's the thing. Um, and again, with, with Eagleman, I'm sorry, I think like readers will probably be amazed. I think he probably mechanizes people in the beginning for its shock value because it really is a shocking read in the beginning. It's fascinating, you know, it's, it's completely fascinating. But, um, but yeah, hopefully um, he'll move on to kind of like humanizing the, the mind. And I think that's what I want to kind of do a bit now. Um, we are hedonic creatures. In other words, like we're programmed, we're fated, not of our free will, to, um, to do what we think is going to like create 
the most pleasure, the least pain. So, what happens is if considering, if understanding that we don't have a free will leads also to the understanding that somehow we're, we're just a robot or just a puppet or something like that, then naturally many of us are going to resist, you know, because of this hedonic imperative, because we're programmed to, you know, want to experience reality in the way that's most pleasant. Apparently for us, our humanity um, is a more pleasant um, way of seeing ourselves as, than, um, than as machines. I mean, it makes perfect sense. Um, all right, so here's the thing. I'm religious. I believe in God. I, um, I equate God with the universe. If God is omnipresent, then God is everywhere. Well, the universe is everywhere. If God is omnipotent, God is the power in the universe. God is like the forces of nature. God is the causal process. Um, so what happens is, um, and I, I reject the, um, the kind of um, depersonalization of, of kind of um, reality. In other words, <clears throat> some people will say, well, there is that, um, that there is a universe, but the universe is an it, not a, um, a person, you know, it's not personified like, like God. But, um, but I prefer, you know, my hedonic, I was raised religiously, I prefer to, um, to see God as in a personified way rather than in this like um, way of like reality being a collection of neurons and, and all. Because th these are just labels, you know, these are labels for things that, um, that we don't know their, their true nature anyhow. But so like the same kind of reasoning that I go through to kind of like understand that yes, we live in a physical reality, but we can personify that reality. You know, God can be personified. Um, God can be seen as, as you know, physical existence. Uh, so if we, if we apply this reasoning to the issue of free will, the issue of human will, the illusion of free will, then... Um, what happens is um, we become instruments of God. We, um, we manifest God's will. I mean, in a certain sense, we are God because, um, you know, everything is interconnected. We, we are one. There's no, like, separation between us and the rest of the universe, really. Um, it's a Buddhist thought, but it, um, it certainly makes sense um, scientifically also. There, there are no barriers between things. There's an exchange of, of energies and all. Um, so so that's, that may be the key. Um, certainly, just considering and appreciating the benefit of, of no longer having a good reason or a reason to blame others or yourself or to feel, yeah, to feel guilty. Um, no longer having a good reason to feel arrogant, you know, or, or to feel envious of someone. You know, certainly these are good, good, um, good reasons to... Um, to transcend the illusion of free will, but, but you know, to be able to, to see ourselves as not having a free will and being the instruments of God, I think, I think um, would appeal to, to those of us who need to, um, to feel that that personified reality, that, that personified identity, and but also understand and feel the need to, um, to accept the truth that, um, 
that free will is an illusion and that our human will is causal and that reality is causal. Um, so that, you know, I think that, that would help people. I think that, that, you know, that's something that's needed. And the other thing, I mean, like, okay, um, science is amazing. Science is fascinating. I mean, you know, just look through any scientific American, um, new scientist, whatever. This stuff is like mind boggling. And, um, and it is mind boggling that reality is a movie. It's mind boggling that we're just going along for the ride and that reality has determined or faded that we think we're not just going for, for the ride, that we think we're actually in control of the decisions we make. I mean, it's mind-boggling. Both of those facts are mind-boggling, but to me, the more, more mind-boggling of the two is the first, that the reality is a movie, that everything that's happening was destined to happen, could not but have happened, you know, and, um, and then when we take that perspective, it becomes a brand new world. Um, in your personal life, you can see it, you know, as, as you change how you re react to your reality, to the other people in your life, to yourself, to the world. Um, now, naturally, it, it will take a, a while, presumably, for, for the world to sufficiently understand that free will is an illusion to then, you know, be amazed by that fact. But, um, but that's like, you know, um, I start out the show with that quote by John Searles. Um, it's addressing the prospect that free will is an illusion. You know, that would be a bigger revolution in our thinking than Einstein, Newton, Copernicus, Galileo, and Darwin. Uh, then he goes on to say um, something to the effect that it would change um, our whole mindset or something like that. Um, it's, it's an evolutionary leap. You know, we go from homo, you know, believe in free will, to homo, um, causal will. <laughs> um, I wonder, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm wondering if actually this does um, justify a, um, a new designation, you know, away from homo, homo sapiens. Um, because basically these designations reflect a substantial major change um, from, you know, the um, previous um, species. Um, what is, I don't know, class, phyla, who knows, I don't know, I guess species, but, um, but yeah, it, it, it's like, it's major, it's, it's, it's a brand new world, um, and it's going to be cool to see how it develops, um, because, um, because, you know, we, we, if we had a free will, we would know how it developed too, because we would make it developed. It, it would be up to us um, how it developed. But you know, but because we don't, because we rely on fate, because everything is faded, because everything is causal, we um, we hope that it's going to be um, amazing and wonderful. And you know, the other thing is like, while we can never know the future, we can certainly. Um, predict it to to great extent. I mean, like, you know, we know exactly where the Earth is going to be relative to its position around the sun at any given moment. Um, we certainly don't know what, what um, how this evolution of, of, of consciousness from the illusion of free will to the causal will is going to um, proceed, but I think working with it as I have for dec decades and now, 
very, um, very much so for the last few years, um, I would predict that um, it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful change. Um, you know, the, the concerns need to be addressed. People need to understand that civilization is not going to collapse, that they're, you know, that their lives are going to be enhanced rather than, um, you know, and, um, but, but that's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, this is a very, we're, we're living in a very cool time because, like, you know, interestingly, the, the two major challenges, the, the one that isn't so very long term with the global economy, we've got to fix that, but the major one that's going to be with us for decades is, is climate change, global warming. And um, the relevance of human will to that is that my understanding is that um, one reason why we're not addressing it is because the people who are responsible for it kind of like understandably don't want to like admit it because of the uh, repercussions. But, you know, God willing, we ultimately come to... Um, the global understanding that free will is an illusion and that we have just a causal will, then we can just proceed to do what has to be done without blame, you know, and, um, and that, that's how, you know, this issue of human will actually may be um, a pivotal um, factor in, 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 our, in addressing the, the greatest challenge for the, for the next several decades. All right, well, I think that's all for today. I hope you've enjoyed the show. And... Um, you know, I will be back, fate willing, with some more episodes sometime soon.